So right now we must talk about the great and amazing and incomparable Walt Whitman, uh, the father of American poetry and somebody who encapsulated so many phenomenal, uh, mystical, amazing, profound ideas uh, in just this one piece that we read, uh, that it's the type of thing where you can read it once and then go back and read it again and again and again for years and always sort of find something new. Uh, Whitman was somebody who uh, was very uh, struck by his experience in the Civil War. Uh, he tended for the wounded and saw uh, a lot of horrible misery. Uh, and the, the thought that many of uh, the beautiful thoughts that he had about the world, the, the inclusiveness that he had about the world came in the wake of this event uh, is truly profound. He was praised by Emerson, and in fact, uh, Emerson had written uh, a note to him, uh, you know, saying, uh, congratulations, and, you know, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, and then Whitman went ahead and uh, published that writing from Emerson, and that sort of irked Emerson a little bit because he hadn't intended it for the public, but, but anyway. Um, Whitman, uh, his long lines were in many ways semi-heretical, uh, in the world of poetry because, you know, of course he was coming up at, in the wake of, you know, strict blank verse and iambic pentameter and stuff like that. And he's obviously, you know, rambling along these long lines and being very effusive. Uh, so it was something different. Uh, the book that this poem, Song of Myself, comes from is called Leaves of Grass. And he uh, continuously revised this over the course of his lifetime. Uh, all the way up until the so-called deathbed edition. Uh, early editions of the Song of Myself, uh, of Song of Myself, uh, were actually, it was untitled, it wasn't broken into sections, which of course made it uh, significantly more difficult to read. So the one that we're dealing with is the deathbed edition. So some of the ideas that he puts forth in here that are truly monumental. We're just going to sort of uh, touch on a little bit at a time. And while uh, I'm going through this, I'd like you just to sort of consider these things and try to take them on into your own life. So one thing he gets off right from the very beginning in part one with the idea of universal togetherness, uh, that uh, for what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Uh, the idea that uh, everything that is him uh, is part of us as well. Uh, so some people have come to the wrongful conclusion that Song of Myself is an egocentric uh, endeavor, but in fact it's not. Uh, Song of Myself is basically the idea that all of us uh, are myself, and that when he's speaking for himself, he's also speaking for us, and that when we speak of us, we're also speaking of him, uh, and that it's all linked he also says right from the get-go in section one that we should uh, keep our creeds and schools in abeyance uh, so that we should be careful uh, not to just buy into the things that we've been taught. You know, that uh, abeyance means that we should sort of, you know, push them away and keep them at an arm's length so that we're not unduly uh, influenced by our upbringing or, or our education and that we should be open-minded to new things. Uh, section six is one of the more famous sections in this piece where uh, a child comes up to him with some grass and says, what is the grass? And he, of course, does not know how to answer. But then he posits all these possible suggestions. Uh, the main idea of this section is that just like in the Bible, it says dust to dust. Uh, in this conception, it's sort of like grass to grass, uh, that the grass grows and then eventually it feeds animals and turns into people, and then eventually uh, those animals and people die and will be buried in the ground where they themselves will eventually become grass. So there's a cyclic notion to it, sort of the, the beauty of it, where leaves of grass, it's not just grass, you know, that grass needed uh, death to grow, so death and life are part of one uh, ever-continuing cycle. Uh, another big theme of Part six is the idea that we can't answer the big questions, that when somebody comes up and asks you, uh, what is the grass, you know, you can't necessarily answer that question because that's a question only for God. Uh, and he ends this section by saying, and to die is different from anyone supposed and luckier. Uh, because, of course, uh, if you believe that upon death, 
you will be, in a sense, bodily. Uh, where your soul goes is one thing, but uh, your body will continue to remain here on earth and things will grow from it and flourish. Uh, that's why it's lucky because even when you yourself have died, there's still a long future ahead for you. Uh, section 15 is interesting because it, uh, you may have noticed, is just sort of an endless list of different types of people. Uh, in many ways, this prefigures the type of writing that Allen Ginsberg did in the 20th century. Ginsberg was, of course, profoundly influenced by Whitman, as have many writers uh, been. But uh, this endless list sort of gets at the idea of utter democracy and unity, that it doesn't matter whether you're somebody at the top of the world or at the bottom of the world, that we're all uh, in this together. Uh, section 17 touches on uh, humility a lot, where he says that th these thoughts are not original with him. Uh, and this sort of gets the idea, the, the biblical concept, that there's nothing new under the sun. And even though Whitman's making all these proclamations, he acknowledges that uh, many of these ideas are ideas that uh, existed previously. Uh, he also talks a lot in the poem, such as in section 24, about you know democracy, the idea that even the terrible uh, are welcome in this world. Uh, that it doesn't matter, even if you're the lowliest of the low, you still have a seat at the table. Uh, this is sort of like the idea of uh, Jesus uh, being willing to sit down with the tax collectors and prostitutes and such like that, that you can very much see uh, in Whitman's idea of listing all of these people uh, or like considering people who you know have drug problems or who are on the, the outs or who are in prison with these people as well you know, have something beautiful to offer the world. Um, in section 30, it gets to the idea that all truths are in all things, uh, and that quite literally, you know, you can find the truth uh, in, e in every single possible thing. All truths wait in all things. You know, that if you just go out and you look at a single uh, rock or a single uh, piece of grass or a single uh, automobile, uh, that the truth of the creation and the manifestation and the reality of all of the universe is there inherent in that one thing. Um, section 32 is very interesting because it talks a lot about animals and how animals do not weep for their sins and how they're not uh, obsessed with owning things. And this is sort of an instance where he's calling out human beings for, for our fickleness, you know, how we uh, are constantly full of lamentation uh, for what we've done wrong and what we could do right. And we're constantly seeking to, you know, own more things and, you know, have a greater amount of possessions, but that animals don't do this and that in their way, uh, they have sort of achieved a greater uh, purity because of that absence. And that brings us to sort of the closing movement, um, starting with section 48. Uh, where he touches on some of his, uh, you know, biggest ideas of all, uh, such as in 48, he says, And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. And then he says, I hear and behold God in every object. You know, that quite literally uh, every single thing in the world, you know, that's where God is. So that if you're looking to try to seek God uh, in some place other than the world, uh, that that would be folly. Of course, that's Whitman's view. There are a variety of different ways of viewing the God situation. But in Whitman, he just opens up his eyes and he looks around him. And that's where he finds God uh, in every filament of being. Um, in section 51, he says, do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Uh, this gets back to that idea that he quite literally is speaking uh, for all of us and for the entirety of the human and earthly experience. And that if it seems like, you know, he's contradicting himself, then that's exactly what he's supposed to be doing because in reality, there are many contradictions. And then the final section. Uh, 52, where uh, he sounds his barbaric yawp and says that if people are looking for him, they can look uh, under their boot soles, which is an interesting thing because most people would not uh, be okay with that much of a humble idea that you should uh, seek to find somebody 
uh, underfoot. Uh, missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Uh, it's profoundly beautiful, this idea that in this long poem, uh, Song of Myself, uh, revised and edited and changed over the course of a lifetime, uh, speaks for so many different cosmic issues and so many different possibilities. And the idea that uh, if we go out into the world and we try to seek the truth, uh, it'll be there. You know, and that when he says, I stop somewhere waiting for you, it's not just him. It's not Walt Whitman uh, standing there. It's the truth. It's God. It's reality. It's beauty.